Um, and now we go to a man who is one of my heroes. I've got so many. Chris Knight has been a wonderful man. I won't ask him to talk because you won't understand a word he says because of his Norfolk accent. And Come on, boy. <laughs> I, I wish I'd got an accent like Chris. And I'm serious when I say he should be Lord Knights of Fakenham or Swaffham. Come Swatham. on. He is the man who almost single-handedly um, saved the stone curlew from extinction in Britain. And I have to say, too, don't you sigh like that. <laughs> it is such an honour and a privilege to have him as a trustee and a member of the CRT. Chris Knight. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. I don't quite know how to follow all that up, but... Um, I'm giving you a, a short uh, talk this evening, just with a few images. And um, the most iconic bird um, which uh, is on farmland is the lapwing. Now, we, we have uh, looked after lapwings quite a lot. And um, they nest in open countryside like this. And you can see uh, there's no hills. That's in, in Breckland in Norfolk. Uh, the biggest hill is about uh, 120, 120 feet. And um, we do this uh, stone separating for, or we used to do, I don't, don't do it now, but we used to do it for, for um, growing vegetable crops. And he's lifted up and gone over this lapwing's nest and she's now flying down. Her, the mate is down near the front of the tractor and um, within uh, five minutes, sitting very comfortably on the nest. Well, you'd think that was okay, but uh, the main trouble happens when um, the lapwing hatches its chicks, the weather can change. She's got four chicks under there, and that's, that's raining very, very hard. And um, just a, a blitz screen of things, what can happen. Uh, we've got red kites now as uh, we have, uh, well, red kites are ne nesting round near us locally. We n I went to Wales when I was uh, about uh, 17 to see a red kite, and that only rained every day, and we never saw one. <laughs> but um, <laughs> lapwings don't like pheasants, because pheasants uh, are predators, as, as all birds are predators to each other. If that's a meal, what they can make use of, they eat it. They can't walk into a room like we've just been and people rushing around with tray fulls of sandwiches. And um, so, but this one is like square dancing with this pheasant. <laughs> that, um, and this, this is why I, I call this moments in time because these were taken at uh, two thousandths of a second and um, uh, one of the cameras I've got now will take 60 pictures a second. And this is in the autumn time, this time of the year, there's a lapwing and a golden plover and a hare. Uh, lapwings don't mind hares at all. And, um, but these black-headed gulls are pirates and they can chase lapwings and they, they watch them and as soon as they grab a worm, you'll get two to four uh, gulls chase it and and pursue it, and if you look carefully, you can see the worm just falling out. The lapwing drops the worm, and the gulls leave off and uh, take the worm. And the other, you can see the gull there like a sheepdog looking over the flock of sheep, waiting for a, a golden plover or a lapwing to grab a worm. And um, golden plovers are supposed to be one of the fastest birds in level flight, but I kid you not, that black-headed girl overtake them with ease when they've got a worm. And uh, mind you, they cut the corners off as well. <laughs> and the other thing we've had in the last, uh, well, I suppose since the 90s, really, we've had buzzards nest. And on this field, 
this was a winter wheat field, they were collecting worms. You can see that um, buzzard there was got a large crop. There was 12 buzzards on this field, but uh, I thought that was quite a lot till uh, this last weekend. And I went to an oil seed rape field stubble where a friend had told me, and there was, we saw over 40 buzzards on this field, but we don't know what they were feeding on. And we saw the gamekeeper, he said he'd, he'd counted 51. This was last, uh, last weekend on the field. But it's bad news for hares because uh, we filmed this nest uh, for uh, about uh, 10 days, and the only thing that ever brought in to feed the, the youngsters was, was leverets, apart from two rats one day. In fact, they changed the character of the hares. They don't lay out in the open like they used to. Another bird was very successful and could be shot all the year round, only lays two eggs, is the wood pigeon. And this is mainly because it can eat cereal and eat uh, um, brassicas and uh, it's got a great variety to its diet. The other bird we've lost quite a lot is the house sparrow. And um, the house sparrow, <laughs> I had to have our roof uh, refelted this last year and we used to have 20 pairs of house sparrows in it. So I bought 10 nest boxes off Nicholas Watts and um, I think we've had at least two or three pairs in each box this year, so that was quite good. But uh, the Swifts didn't come back and the Starlings nested in the Swift boxes. But that food source can soon disappear with, with modern combines and uh, this, this combine with a, with a 35 foot uh, cut can soon clear up and leave very, very little foodstuffs for, for wildlife. One of the things we do have in Breckland is um, a lot of open, um, open uh, air pigs. <laughs> and um, there's a company called um, Cranworth from uh, Watton. They sell 50,000 pigs a week to China. Uh, so. We're, and we are only producing 45% of our own pork. So, you know, that's truck and trade around the world. Uh, the, the thing what the pigs have done, that has introduced a lot of wildlife to our part of the world. And you can see these uh, lesser blackbacks and herring gulls. And that's changed. A few years back, they all used to be black-headed gulls. And now we're getting all these larger gulls come in. And... Um, you can see the stone curlews sitting down beside the pig. There, I took that about uh, two weeks ago. We had um, up to 103 stone curlews this autumn time is the highest count, but last year we had 161, not my figures, I, I wouldn't profess to say, but uh, 161 stone curlews, which I think is the biggest flock sort of ever recorded in Breckland. So they're not doing too bad. That, and this was where they're flying across. You can see the skyline behind how this Breckland is changing with wind, wind turbines and uh, a wireless mast. But uh, that's five miles away, so <laughs> that's uh, not affecting those. And this is a pig feeder hopper, and you can see the starlings, they, they enjoy it. They've all just come in this last few weeks, and they're actually cooing up to get in one climbs up and opens the door and the rest all pile in. <laughs> this, is, this is an off spin of the pigs. Uh, we had shell ducks come in the late 1990s because they stack up these big bale stacks and there's holes in them all, all at varying heights and shell ducks nest in these stacks and um, they, uh, well, <laughs> We have between 20 and 30 pairs uh, in our immediate area of shell ducks. Where we, before, before the mid-90s, we never had any. But uh, if, a, if one of these gulls happens to go near the shell ducks, where they got these chick, these ducklings, and um, they can give it a real pasting. And um, both uh, fail, male, female and male go in hard as you see, and the male then uh, says, we've done a good job on that, dear. <laughs> but, 
But having said that, having said that, that goal recovered, that goal recovered, staggered to the bank, and then there were some lapwing chicks, and the lapwings were knocking, knocking it about. So that had a bad morning. <laughs> this is another uh, site of Breckland. Um, that speck in the lower half of the picture is a woodcock in, in the winter stubble. And um, woodcock are now coming in at this time of the year. And a friend of mine saw two on the coast um, last week. And this was taken in 2011 when we had a hard winter. This was in December. And um, the whole farm was full of woodcock. There was five under this bush, but I couldn't get them all in the picture. So, I mean, uh, this is our most commonest wading bird in the UK in the wintertime. And, of course, grey partridges, uh, we have heard uh, how they're faring up and down the country. Some places, uh, this is in North Norfolk, one very cold uh, wintry morning. And um, there's favoured areas. Grey partridges have done very well this year, or they've had a good year. And um, they have certain fields and certain type of ground they like. And I do think very like Bre Breckland sandy soil is not the best for them. Now, this um, goldfinch, the same year, uh, this was on a stubble field, and these are those little nettles, those little sharp nettles you can get in your garden, but they have a lot of seeds on, and he was burrowed down, and he was feeding on the seed, and every now and again he, he'd come up to have a look round. And he, there was quite a number of them doing this on the field. But these goldfinches and linnets are on a, where there were stubble turnips and they'd been fed off with sheep and there's quite a lot of food on there as, as there is on some of that doing at this very moment. And um, the goldfinches have been a, a very successful bird. We keep hearing about all the birds going down in farmland and that, but gold, gold, I'm sure you've got feeders in your, with good seed, of course, feeders in your yard which has uh, got gold, uh, got lots of goldfinches coming on, but not many linnets. And rooks is another bird. And rooks have been doing very well, uh, but um, th at the moment they, um, they seem to be hesitating. Um, some of the rookeries have gone down in Norfolk, but uh, basically that's a bird what had doubled in the last uh, 30 years. This was standing on the uh, back... Uh, step outside and these rooks fly home every night over the, over the house and there happened to be a rainbow that, that particular evening I was looking out so I, I took a few pictures of them. Mind you when I say the rooks about uh, half, nearly half on the jackdaws and this, this uh, last week or two you've probably all seen large flocks of field fairs coming in and uh, which they do I had a ride around in North Norfolk and I saw three large, really large flocks of field fairs. These ones had just come in, in and been feeding on Hawthorne and then drinking in the puddles on the, on the roadway. Very attractive bird, like a lot of the Scandinavians, bold and dashing and uh, really hold its own against any of our blackbirds or song thrushes. Also at this time of the year, lots of pink-footed geese now coming in and, and feeding, and things keep changing. Uh, you can get uh, several hundred, uh, well, tens of thousands of them on the North Norfolk coast, uh, feeding on sugar beet fields and stubble fields early on the year. These, these ones, um, if you can see them, the, there's a sugar beet lump on the, on the right-hand side, and all those white edges around there is where the hares have been feeding on the sugar beet, to showing you how important a sugar beet crop is to, to a great variety of wildlife. And um, Dick Potts, his second book on partridges, uh, he said, well, sugar beet are not much good for food, but they're good for cover. I said, well, I've got some good pictures of uh, partridges where they come feeding every day on, on this sugar beet on the end of the headland. And... Uh, he weren't very complimentary about it because he'd had to write that chapter again. 
But, um, and the, the geese, you might see a large flock of them. That is a large flock, but they're all still in their family parties. And the goose and gander will look after the goslings and are very jealous of them. And they've got massively powerful bills because the sugar beet is quite hard and they can feed it up and, and take it off. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much.